Uh, good morning, everyone. Today we have a session on automated forensic examination issues and challenges. I welcome you all on behalf of Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science. I request my co-host Astha and Mani to start the session. Over to you, Astha and Mani. Thank you so much, sir. A very good morning to you too. And a very good morning and warm welcome to Dr. Rajesh Kumar, sir. Uh, we are glad and happy that you accepted our invitation for delivering an expert talk on the topic automated forensic examination issues and challenges. Sir, it's our honor to have you among us. We also wish you a very happy Gandhi Jayanti. Now, I request my co-host Mani to introduce you uh, to the audience so that they can have a brief insight about your doings. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Asta. A very good morning, everyone. Thank you each and every one of you being here with us today. We are very pleased to welcome those of you that have been with us for a long time now, as well as those who are new to the expert talk also. Today we have Rajesh sir with us. Let's start with a brief description about sir. Sir is working as the head of Department of Forensic Science, Government Institute of Forensic Science, Aurangabad, Maharashtra. He has completed master's and PhD in forensic science in 2006 and 13 respectively. He has been working in the area of automated forensic examination for more than 15 years. His area of research includes computational forensic, multimedia forensic, image processing and pattern recognition. Quality of his research is evident from his publications and journal of high impact factors. Before joining the academics, he has worked in various FSLs of the country, including CFSL Hyderabad and FSL Delhi for more than eight years and examined more than 300 cases. He has delivered more than 60 invited talks in various institutions, included IIT Delhi, ISI Kolkata and CBI Academy Ghaziabad. For his contribution to the forensic community, he has received the prestigious Young Scientist Award for the Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. Thank you so much, sir, for being here with us. Over to you, Asta. Thank you so much, Mani, for introducing him so beautifully. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you, sir. So thank you, Asta, Mani, Dr. Ranjit, and SIFS for having me here. Thank you for your kind words, which you have uttered for me. So. Uh, First of all, uh, we'll start uh, by giving the tribute to two legendary persons of the Indian history, Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri. So we can uh, think that these those two persons are pillar of uh, Indian uh, democracy, which we are having. So you can think that uh, they have always advocated the, the idea of indigenous things, which has to be here in India and independence. So uh, I think uh, let me share my screen first and then we'll uh, start our discussion on automated forensic examination. I hope my screen is visible to everyone. Yes, and sir, it is. Wonderful. So friends, uh, today we're going to talk about automated forensic examination. So uh, before I start the topic, let me uh, start with uh, my uh, going back to my memory lane. So it was way back in 2009, I was uh, giving a talk at IIT Delhi. So I was talking about a uh, similar kind of topic and we were uh, just discussing how image processing and pattern recognition can help uh, in forensic examination. And uh, one student, of uh, BA, uh, you can say BE or BTEC first year in electronics and telecommunication. He asked me, sir, uh, I'm very surprised that many of these techniques which you are saying that is be, being used in forensic science. So that is not at all automated. And you are saying that uh, you do all these things in manual examinations. So friends, uh, I think it's uh, more than 12 years now but uh, the scenario has not changed much. So there, there may be many reasons. So uh, today we are going to discuss uh, about automated forensic examinations and what are their issues and challenges. So uh, the talk will go like this. First, we'll talk about uh, the motivation behind automatic, 
automated forensic examination. Why we need this kind of examination? And that will be followed by processes which is uh, followed in automated forensic examination. Then uh, we will also talk about what we contributed in automated forensic examination. And lastly, we'll discuss challenges and path forward. And I welcome, I will welcome all of you to have a good discussion after this talk. So meanwhile, if you have any question, you can put in chat box. We are going to take all those questions at the end. Uh, so what are the driving force? Why we need an automated system for forensic examination? So uh, I think if you see the history of forensic science, which uh, was started in India and outside, it is now for more than 100 years. We are doing lots of things. We are talking about industry 4.0, 5.0. We're talking about automation. But forensics somehow is lagging behind. So uh, there must be some reasons. And uh, it is not uh, that I'm saying like this. There are various reports. There are various things which has uh, came out all around the globe, which has criticized forensic examinations or forensic examination processes many times. It is not about all forensic examination processes, but few of them was criticized by various reports. Either it is in India or outside. So let us discuss uh, from very recent one to uh, the back one. So as we know that uh, uh, when uh, Obama used to be the president of the United States, so he showed uh, a report regarding forensic examination, whether it is going accurately or what are the problems, what are the challenges which is going on, and uh, which came in the form of what we call as PCAST report. Before that, an RC report in 2009, you must be familiar with, uh, which was basically recommendation problems and recommendation in forensic science in the United States. But uh, the main milestone, which we can say the change uh, which changes the forensic world was basically Daubert. So uh, before Daubert, uh, there was a case of polygraph when uh, it was uh, came across the court of law in the United States. So it was find that uh, what kind of scientific evidence should be acceptable. So it was general acceptability. But Daubert had changed everything. Let's say if you want to give any scientific evidence in the court of law, they should go with certain procedure. They should have or they should satisfy certain criteria. And for that uh, court has been made gatekeeper that they need to see that whatever is being introduced, whatever scientific evidences are being given, that should be foolproof. And that is why those all five things has to be uh, followed. We are going to discuss that in the next slide. But uh, one thing which was common in all these uh, reports or all these observations was these things which is highlighted here. So what has been observed that there is lack of proper scientific research in forensic setup. We are also in objectivity and And many examinations still in forensics are opinion based. Whenever you see the manual one, and that cannot be free from bias. That is what the observation was. So uh, these all were the problems. So these were all were the problems which were uh, highlighted in all these reports. As far as Dobbert is concerned, I am giving uh, more emphasis on that. So Dobbert is saying that whatever uh, we are doing, whatever scientific evidence we are presenting to the court of law, that should follow all these five criteria. So it should be testable, like anybody can test it. Let's say you're reporting something based on some criteria, some condition. If somebody would like, so they should get the same result. And that is what the testable means. It should be peer reviewed. It should be reviewed by the peers in the community. There should be a standard operating procedure 
path should be followed exactly and uh, uh, the result should be reproducible doing that potential error rate was the thing which uh, arises lots of problem at that time in 1993 because uh, you, you must be knowing being a uh, being in forensic fraternity that uh, whenever we give give our result we say okay 100 percent yeah it is perfect match the match is perfect it should be the same person but uh, have you validated it statistically? What kind of error we are giving? Have you validated that? So what kind of, uh, we know that whenever we are examining evidences that is having a certain uncertainty, and then have we measured those un uncertainty and reporting the potential error rate? So all these things was highlighted during Dobbert. And finally, there, there should be generally accepted. There should be a group, a community, which is accepting your technique and then only those techniques is going to be accepted in the court of law. So uh, these are the things which was highlighted in 1993, although there was revision in 2000 of Dobbert, but uh, these all criteria, these all five criteria has been uh, still important for all those evidences which are accepted in uh, United States. So uh, now uh, taking this note that uh, we need to highlight all those things. We need to address all those five things which has been, uh, uh, you can say highlighted during Dobbert or maybe in PCAST or NRC. So uh, we need to understand that what can be automated in forensics. So what part of forensic examination can be automated? Can we automate everything? So here I have highlighted some points. So let's say if we need to recognize or link impression evidences, that is the one that which you can easily automate. There's no problem about that. So if you want to link trace evidences, recognize trace evidences, that can also be automated. So person identification, of course, can be automated as you know, the biometric is, is existing and doing well. Problem related to question documents. That was the major area which uh, got set back during uh, like after 1993. But lots of things has, has been done. Standards have come. Groups have been made. So there, there are lots of things which happened. But uh, like many of the processes which we follow in uh, question document examination, that can be automated. Analysis of digital evidence is, of course, let's say if we want to retrieve some data, we want to archive something, we want to search something, all those things can be done automatically easily. But uh, whether this kind of list is exhausted, whether uh, this is a complete list, no. So what we can automate? Almost everything where you need to make a decision, where, where, where there is uh, involvement of manual decision process, you can make all those process automated. So let's say uh, like uh, uh, chemometry is a good example. Let's say uh, we have done some analysis and we need to do uh, whatever data we have got from the instrumental analysis, we want to make uh, uh, opinion based on that. We want to say that whether uh, the match is perfect or not, if we are comparing, or let's say if we are identifying, so can we say it with confidence? So chemometry is one, example which is saying where we would like to make the decision so you can make that process automatic i hope i'm audible so yes, uh, thank you so automatic process so what kind of automatic process is there so basically when we talk about automation we are talking about classification of clustering and regression so what we are automating, so basically we are making classification. Classification, uh, it is different from uh, what we use in general term in forensic. For example, let's say I'm a person, I'm generating fingerprint from a particular finger. So whatever fingerprint I'm generating from that particular finger, so that is my attributes of those fingerprints and I'm the class. So here person may be the class. And I'm identifying person based on that. So that problem is basically classification and recognition problem. Clustering is uh, like if we have similar kind of objects and we are making group of that. So that is basically clustering. So that can be done automatically. 
Regression is about, as you know, most of uh, most of you know about statistics. You must have uh, read this during your forensic curriculum, or maybe at some point of time when statistics was taught to you. So regression is about prediction. So let's say we have data. So uh, pre-processing is making that data suitable, suitable form. So what is the meaning of suitable form? Let's say we have captured a data. Let's say fingerprint data we have captured. So it might happen during capturing process, some of the uh, ridges has not been joined properly. They are uh, uh, not continuous, although they are having, all the ridges are having the same angle, but uh, they are not joining. So all these things we take care in pre-processing. So in pre-processing phase, those, thing, those things will be taken care of. We make data suitable for further analysis, for feature extraction, let's say in this case. Okay, so uh, feature, what is feature extraction? So basically we want to describe or represent an object or whatever we do, let's say we're talking about fingerprints. So we want to represent in terms of some characteristics. For example, let's say we have your apple and banana. So let's say we want to represent an apple. So how we can identify, how we are identifying that this is an apple. So there may be, there may be shape, which is, uh, uh, which is in your mind that shape uh, apple is like this, or maybe the color. So depending on that, you are saying. Similarly, uh, for banana, you may have shape, you may have uh, color, idea that, okay, banana is of this shape and this color, maybe sometimes texture also, like in apple, if you see the texture is like this, so that may be, that may be apple, or that may be banana. So uh, these are the things, basically, we, talk, we means, uh, which we mean by feature. So feature uh, should not be understand like, oh, we are saying that, okay, we are extracting features. So it does not mean that we are doing very complicated thing, not like that. So it may be very simple things also. Only thing is that, only criteria is that it should uh, be representative and describing that object well, which we want to identify. So uh, that is what we do in feature extraction. I'm not complicating the, these things by introducing features like SIF, which are like uh, HOG, which are like many other features which are existing in machine learning things. But we know since we, most of we are from forensics, so uh, most of these concepts are new to us. So that is why I'm uh, keeping the things simpler so that we can understand it well. Okay. So mm, now the thing is that we have had some features, but whether these features are good or bad. So features may be of three kind. So it may be a good feature, it may be a bad feature, or it may be a redundant feature. For example, let's say uh, a work has been given to a group, right? If uh, five person is doing that work, and two person is doing that work. So two person is doing the same thing in five hours and five person is also doing that work in five hours. It means what? There are some repetitions. We don't need that much of persons, right? Similarly, things happens with the features also. Uh, like in case of, well, let, let me give an example of bad features. So let's say uh, two persons are doing the work in five hours and when you are having five persons, they are doing the work in 10 hours. So it means there is some disrupting element which has to be removed out. So uh, that, is, that is what the meaning of feature selection is. There are many techniques, uh, basically three types of technique we can classify all of them. One is filter, wrapper, and embedded. Filter is uh, basically kind of technique where we consider each feature independently. So let's say if we have 10 features, so we are evaluating every feature independently and there is no interactions between features. So there is something called teamwork also. Like if we work in team, we can do well. So that is not considered here in filter method. So that is based on some criteria. Maybe we can uh, 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 apply any, any kind of parameter, maybe entropy or maybe t-test based criteria we can have there. And then wrapper method, we, we take care of interaction between the features. So let's say if one feature is doing good alone, but if we are considering two features, so 
So whether the performance is increasing or decreasing, and that will be the thing when we will say that we need to discard the second or we should keep the second. And embedded is uh, during classification, during recognition, feature selections is also being done. Examples are many, like one is FSN now, which is feature selection through machine uh, multi-layer perceptron. So uh, these are uh, uh, the concept of what we call as feature selection. Then is the classification. So classification um, means, let's say, we have been given a problem of identifying or uh, separating between banana and apple. So we, we want to, we want to uh, identify banana and apple. Of course, they are two different classes. So we need to find out, we need to learn a boundary which can discriminate between these two things. So as you can see here, so maybe uh, if we have a two dimensional data, so this is dimension one and this is dimension two. So this is one kind of data and this is another kind of data. Right, And we have made, based on these data, we have learned, during learning, we have made a boundary. We have decided to a boundary. Now, if we have got some new thing, we have to say that whether this belongs. So whether this belongs to this class, let's say this is class one or class two. So this we need to do. So as we have decided this as a decision boundary, we can say that this will belong to class one. And this is what the simple concept of classification is. So the learning, which I was saying that we need to learn the system, we need to train the system. So the training or learning or the machine learning processes, they are of three types. One is called unsupervised, supervised, and reinforced or reinforcement learning. So when we talk about unsupervised, this is in the absence of any teacher, any supervisor, and that is why it is unsupervised. What, what is uh, the meaning of supervisor or teacher? You don't know about the class level. We don't know about the object. But what you do is you identify the things or you classify, uh, sorry, you group the things based on the similarity of objects. Let's say, for example, we have two objects here. We don't know what is object one, this blue color plus, and the circle, we don't know. But at least we know that these kind of things are having similar property. And that is why we are identifying, we are putting it one. Way. Similarly, we know that this kind of yellow circle is of similar type, and we are putting it another group, group two. So this is what unsupervised learning is. So system or the learning machine identify the similarity in the object. And based on that, it is put in the cluster. It is made in terms of the cluster. And that is why unsupervised learning is. And examples of unsupervised learning are k-means clustering, radical clustering, self-organizing map, and PCA, uh, which is used for dimensionality reduction, and above three are for the clustering. So uh, these are some examples. We don't have uh, time to go to this uh, detail, go in detail of all those things. But uh, only thing we will understand all those systems, basically, of clustering does this kind of thing by deciding few parameters. So those parameters may be anything. Like in case of uh, k-means clustering, we give some value of k and that many clusters are being made based on the similarity measure. Again, similarity measure, what kind of similarity measure we would like to take. So that will be decided by the user based on the problem. Or that can be optimized also based on the problem. So that can also be made automatically. Uh, supervised learning is in presence, learning in presence of a supervisor. So let's say we give, uh, let's say how a child is getting trained, getting learned. So let's say we show some object and say, uh, uh, baby, this is apple. This is apple, this is banana. And we continuously say, continuously give to the kid. And one day you see that your kid who is very small saying, okay, give me apple. And this, if you see, if you give him or her banana, he or she will say, no, this is banana, give me apple. 
So here we have basically, when we uh, talk it technically, we have class level. We know that what objects are. And accordingly, we classify. So based on this data, we can say that the output data is banana orange. We know that in advance that here we have these kind of data. And our system identify given an unlabeled data, given a data for which level is not known, what is this? So it will be said that, okay, it is an, it is an upper. So that is what the con concept of supervised learning is. And there are many examples of supervised learning, k-nearest neighbor machine, or uh, that is MLP, multi-layer perceptron, which is a kind of uh, artificial neural network, or, which is basically artificial neural network, support vector machine, linear discriminant analysis. So these, there are many, many things. So uh, that is uh, like, cannot be discussed in more detail. If you want uh, more discussion, so that can be done in uh, like further sessions. But okay, uh, let's say, let me give a brief idea about some this KNN and uh, maybe SVM, which is simpler to explain. So let's say this is one class and this is another class, class one and class two, and we are getting some unknown object. So in KNN, what basically we do, these are the data for which we know the class level. You know the class level, what does it mean? Like in last example, we have seen. So what we are doing basically, from this level data, we get the distance of all these things. So we have, we, we have found the distance of all these things and we find that which one is the nearest one. So let's say if this is the nearest one, so we put this unknown object into this class. That is what KNN is. Similarly, uh, this SVM, what it does, it try to have the maximum maybe infinite number of decision boundary, which we can get. But here it get the optimal one. Let's say this is the maximum margin, so we can have something like this. Uh, so uh, this is what SVM is. So let me again draw it here. Let us, let's say this is an object. So we find this is the direction. This is the direction. So we have taken the maximum margin. This will be the boundary. This is going to be the boundary. So that is what the supervised learning is in simplest word. Third is reinforcement learning. So this works on the basis of reward and risk. So let's say we don't know what kind of feature we should take and what uh, we should do. We just give the system learn by itself, by doing error, by uh, doing error and reward. So that is what is known as reinforcement learning. Uh, nowadays, you must have heard the term deep learning, which is associated with reinforcement, which is kind of reinforcement learning. So here uh, we are not saying this is this object and this is not identifying based on the identical characteristic, rather it go for doing error and correct itself during the training phase. So there will be a rigorous training phase as you can understand. Data should also be more. Now, uh, like if we want to evaluate the performance of the system which is being made. So these are uh, the, some of the, you can say, The false positive may be there, as you can see, positive. Uh, there may be some negative data that could be said as positive. There may be false negative. There may be equal error rate, precision recall, F score, etc. There may be uh, these kind of error for a two class problem. Similarly, for multi class problem, there may be another set of error. And those things uh, can be uh, find out, or those can be taken using either receiving operator curve or maybe area under curve or maybe detection error trade-off. These are the various curves which we apply. I'm just introducing these terms to you uh, uh, for the reason that uh, you can go for uh, further uh, reading for the study and you can have all those things. If you will have any question regarding this, we are in any case going to take at the last of this session. Now uh, we are going to like in next uh, 10, 15 minutes, or next 15 minutes, we are going to discuss uh, 
the automated methods, automated uh, techniques, which were designed by our team was uh, at some point of time, was now also we are designing uh, the kind of systems, though these are not, uh, how you can say, available in the market, but for research purposes only. So uh, the first thing which we have done way back uh, in 2009 to 12 was uh, fraud detection in check. And you can know, given a check, what kind of uh, problem you have to have. So let's say in a check, what we can get, we can get alteration in writing. So maybe this one can be made or the, this, the something can be added, something can be deleted. Uh, nowadays, that uh, deleted eraser, erase check is not valid. So addition is one thing, if that can be made easily. So alteration is one thing which can be like addressed. Second is alteration in figure. Let's say this one can be made for easily. This can also be made for, and uh, we can get something like that. The signature may be forged, or you can see the check which is printed. That may be, that may be forged itself. That may be counterfeit. So uh, we have designed solution for all these things. We have given solution for alteration detection in the, uh, uh, you can say machine learning framework. We have also given idea to uh, detect alteration in figures. We have also given system to identify or you can say verify signature, whether it is genuine or not. And we have also done processes to see whether this check is fraudulent or not. So as I uh, shown you that one lakh check has been made for lakhs that has been made. And now, uh, you know that there are many things which are vulnerable for alteration in your check. If uh, it's one, it can be made four, seven may be made 70, one may be made four, seven like this, two can be made three, depending on how it has been written and whether it is easy to do that. Similarly, uh, word may also be altered by adding something like, as you can see, technical can be made non-technical, like can be made unlike, tolerant can be made intolerant, etc. So those things can be made. And if we want to have a generic alteration detection system, how it should work. So uh, basically what we did it, we uh, designed it as a two class problem as we were talking about verification. So uh, the two class problem was like whether this ink or this ink, we could have taken this or this also, and just for uh, just purpose of showing that I'm taking this because whatever is one is, it is uh, supposed to be that this should also be by the same ink. So whether this and this is by the same ink or by different inks. So uh, the most obvious options are what? Available to forensics are what? We go for BSC or we go, we go for destructive analysis, let's say, HPLC, HPTLC, FTIR, or maybe even non-destructive also, FTL microscope can be used. So those are the most, or Raman, the most common technique worldwide uh, acceptance. So uh, this was our pioneer work, which uh, we have done during 9 to 12, 2009 to 12. And here, what we did, we tried to extract features based on the images. So what we had is we had not the data which has come from the instrument that can also be done. Anybody who is doing chemometry, they can do analysis and they can work on that. But here we were totally, uh, our solution is totally based on image processing and pattern recognition, or you can say the machine learning. So we wanted to have a system which should not distract anything at all. Rather, we would like to work on the images. So we have got uh, images of these strokes, we have magnified it and we have got something like this. Hello. Yes, sir, you audible. Okay, so she basically there is a power cut at my place, so that's why I asked. So meanwhile, if you get any problem, so 
you can let me know. Okay, sir. Okay. So, uh, see, we had, uh, you can say, stroke of the same, same pen, and we would like to have uh, the features from this. So, as you can see, by visually looking at these two ink, it is very difficult to say that whether these are of the same pen or from different pens. So, in image processing, what we do, we had had some color and texture feature from this, right? And those color and textures feature was not only based on RGB, which is the, you can say, uh, chromaticity theory of light. Rather, we have gone to opponent chromaticity theory, which says that there are some combination of colors which are not detected by human eyes. And based on that, we have extracted some features and we have find a good accuracy. So like uh, we have a nearest neighbor, got this accuracy. So this was the, that time which we have uh, given the accuracy of our system just based on images and making features. That was very primitive work, not primitive, but that was the first kind of work which has been done in uh, this domain. And that has appeared, uh, you can say, in one of the prestigious journal, which is known as IEEE Transaction Information Forensics and Security. So that is, uh, as you can understand, that is rank one journal in digital forensic domain. So uh, this was the work uh, which we have done. Uh, automate the process of uh, detecting alteration in documents. Then uh, I, I was talking about handwriting. So even in the check, we can say that, okay, the handwriting is the same person or different person. Here, our concept was a bit different. What we have designed here is uh, we have designed our system based on considering the human as a generator of strokes. So what was the basically hypothesis of this kind of system? That whatever strokes we are, formation, that, uh, we are forming, those are limited. And anything which we are writing, that is combination of those strokes only. So let's say how many strokes we are making. We are making 200 strokes, let's say. And whatever we are writing, that is combination of those 200 strokes. And based on this assumption, based on these primitive, we have worked on the system. Like as you can see, uh, let's say this is the stroke which has been made. So that is combination of this and this. Similarly, uh, anything which you are writing, you can observe your handwriting. So that is combination of a fixed number of strokes. And for a particular population or for an entire population, we can have a code book or dictionary of all those, uh, you can say fraglets or these kinds of strokes. And then what we can do, we can uh, map, make a classification based on how many times those kind of uh, strokes are being used by a particular person. So that is what uh, we have used. So I don't want to go to go very technical and kind of Fourier descriptor, Weber descriptor, no. So that has, uh, thing has been done. And based on that, uh, we have made a dictionary of uh, 200 fraglets. And this was the accuracy which we have. We have got 99.24 for top 10. So most of the forensic systems which are automated that is not giving just one best match. Rather, we wanted to get, uh, get 10 best match, and that was giving almost 99.24. So if we could have more, like 20, 30, so it could have been 100%. And that has also appeared in one of the prestigious journals known as patent recognition letters. Again, uh, we have uh, designed and automated the uh, signature verification system. So that was again based on uh, some shape features. We have got some statistical features from them. And uh, again, we have uh, done based on... Uh... So for this kind of system, which we have uh, designed, so that, for that we have got an international recognition in uh, 2010, our system was placed among, among the best signature, best four basically signature verification system around the globe. 
and uh, second among academia. This was the performance of two academic system which were uh, given at that time. So the system of uh, Spain, which is ATVS Spain, that was giving an error rate of 16.43, which has been tested in more than, on more than three lakh signature, or a database of more than three lakh signatures. So this error rate you can see on uh, testing the system on three lakh signature and ours was 17.31. But you can see the execution time, we were just taking 4.43 seconds to say whether uh, two signatures are by the same person or not, and they were taking 7.31. So it means they were loading uh, lots of uh, features here. So that's why the time has gone up. We were taking relatively less, and that's why we were getting less time. So if we could have uh, added more, so our accuracy. Again, we have done some work on uh, counterfeit check detection as a part of that. And there we have got uh, almost 99% accuracy for best, best matching. And uh, in case, let's say we are taking top 10 or something, so accuracy may be 100%. So our recent work are related to uh, mobile phone, phone recognition from images, which we have done based on uh, uh, what we call is uh, PRNU, auto response non-uniformity, which is very common kind of noise for detection of uh, device or linking a device from the images, similar kind of work we have done for audio also. Uh, we have recognized a mobile phone based on so, uh, mobile phone recognition. We have again had a system on that. Uh, we are even working on that, on uh, uh, having various attacks on this. Let's say if we are changing formats, we are changing uh, different other things to see that whether our system is robust or not. So uh, these, uh, we have also designed a system on this and uh, we have tested it uh, on uh, a database. Why is my line up? Okay, so uh, this was the thing uh, which we have got. So we have tested over various file formats and let's say we have a, some audio file in WAV form and we have changed this format and we wanted to see the accuracy. And even at that stage, you can see the accuracy is up to 99 or 100%. So that is what uh, we have done very recently. It was published in 2019. So uh, this was a various system which we have designed and we are working on a few more systems. But uh, see, all these systems we are working in are uh, for research purposes only. If we need to implement it at laboratory level, so what we need is we need a comprehensive database. So that is the first thing which we need. So let's say if we want to give ink identification or something, we are saying it is matching, but have we checked it on population that whether similar this kind of thing is existing or not? So what is required is comprehensive database of everything is required. And this is the work of policy making. Even we can do some effort on that, but that won't be a comprehensive thing. So the first challenge or the foremost challenge to implement all these kind of uh, systems in practical scenario is we need to have a database. And that database of everything should be comprehensive. You must have uh, observed that we purchase the systems from uh, which is made in US, UK, but uh, in India, the database of that country is not at all useful because that is not the population we are studying in or we are examining in. So database is the first thing which is stopping us to implement the same thing in laboratory. So a comprehensive database has to be made. Uh, the authority need to take decision on that. And uh, 
they should make some action to have a comprehensive database. Second, why uh, this kind of system is not encouraged in uh, forensic science laboratory is because it is black box in nature. Uh, kind of uh, what kind of feature we are taking, what kind of analysis we are doing, what kind of classification we are doing. So uh, we cannot say that uh, every person in the laboratory can be teach about uh, automated methods, but yes, some awareness of course can be given such that uh, this black box kind of thing uh, should be uh, familiar to the persons who are working in forensic science laboratory. Okay, why again we are getting discouraging or discouragement for this kind of system here, because uh, there is lack of confidence, lack of confidence in Indian uh, research, but ultimate will be that only Indian research will work for systems which has to be implemented in India, like China is doing the similar kind of thing, whatever system they are having in China, so they are made in China, made by the exports in China. So similarly, like uh, someday we need to have confidence in our researchers so that we can have those kind of systems. Again, uh, whatever uh, system now which we are implementing in our forensic science laboratory, even let it be FS, which we are impl uh, implementing all around. So that is having a very huge cost. So let's say for a software, uh, how much we are giving? We are giving 70 lakhs, 80 lakhs, or maybe sometimes one crore also. But uh, this developing this kind of system in own in our own will hardly cost five lakhs. And uh, maybe if one time it has been done, so it can be or like maintenance cost will not be much. And again, whenever we are buying, discouragement is due to uh, this thing also, like let's say we are having an automated system from outside and we are working on that. So we are always depending on vendors. So they are saying, sir, you have uh, got it for one year. So after one year, you won't get any update, anything, two years, so you, you're not going to get any update in that. Three years, you're not going to get any update on that, depending on what you are having. So those things uh, are there. Those are the challenges which uh, we are having. So what is the path forward? What we need to do? So we need to have an interactive automated system. Interactive means like forensic expert should know that how to interact with the system, how, what kind of parameters he or she wants, what kind of data, what kind of data he can put in, or let's say if they are changing in the data, so that should be accepted by the system. So what is required is interactive system. As we have seen that there are various steps starting from data acquisition to classification and performance evaluation. So interaction can be made at various levels. So uh, if we want to implement it in forensic science setup, it has to be interactive. We cannot uh, go uh, the totally black box kind of system. We must have indigenous research from forensic fraternity. The reason is, it is not like that this kind of system is not existing in India. People are doing work mostly in engineering. They don't know forensics. We know forensics, but we don't know machine learning. Most of us, we don't know machine learning. So there is a huge gap between the one who is doing research in this domain and the person who is working in forensic science laboratory. So what we need to have is we need to bridge the gap between the two. And then only we will get our own indigenous systems uh, which will be effective for our use. Our database, I was saying the database government should do something, but we can also generate database at regional and local level. Let's say if I am working in Aurangabad, some crime is happening in Aurangabad, and if we have a database of voice sample of uh, the citizens of Aurangabad, not all, but representative samples. So again, what we can do is we can have work on that, on that kind of system. So similarly, these kind of effort can be made at our own level, regional and local level. 
but what is important is standardization of processes so whatever we are doing i am doing based on our own methods and there is nobody to standardize it there are nobody to check the qualities whether uh, which i am doing is good or bad so quality control and assurance for that we need to have something so that the work which is done around uh, or you can say this around the country or maybe at various local levels or regional levels in the country so that can be standardized so we need to have some authority to do all those things we need to have someone for quality control and assurance uh these things are important uh, otherwise what i feel is in uh, 10 20 years when people will be aware of forensics in court of law we are going to have very difficult questions to face and uh, that is going to have yeah for critics of uh, automated technique i would like to say that uh, automation is not to replace export export has to be there export need to evaluate the evidence based on the requirement of the court of law requirement of the case we need to have uh, calculate likelihood we need to know uh, what kind of things is going on so automation is not to replace export it is just to make our work easier it is just to have speedy disposal of cases and if not then at least we want to have a second opinion let's say i have done something manually and we want to see let the system say about this what system is saying so uh, at least we will get second or third opinion so we can have our own thing so way back uh, in 2007 when i was working in cfsl hyderabad or at that time gkd hyderabad there was a practice let's say if it is signature verification of handwriting identification to export used to work on that so that is a good practice they were following and even i think they are following so it is always when, when it is opinion based so two people are working together they are having their own opinion and then they are discussing why they are opining that so similarly uh, uh, what we can do is we can have second opinion from automated system at least we can give some think of on that and uh, whatever we are doing that will be more reliable because all these automated techniques which is based on machine learning methods so that is statistically validated giving potential error rate so that must be of course uh, peer reviewed etc that may be uh, reproducible so all those things should be there and uh, i hope like very soon we are going to have automated techniques automated systems in india also which will be indigenous because uh, if you see the scenario right now there are only few developed country who has uh, made their automated system and those are marketing those systems all around the globe but uh, most of the time those systems are not working in our system, uh, our uh, system yes so especially in case of uh, you can see question document examination and many other of like that so uh, of course if uh, we are getting opinion from the machine that is going to eliminate bias which was a major concern in uh, this uh, nrc report and pcast report so that bias can also be eliminated and we can produce more reliable results for court of law so all from my side so i hope i have completed in one hour the time which has been given to me uh thank you very much for giving me the opportunity thank you uh, i'm sorry for the interruption which we had in, in in between because you know that whenever we became online there are some limitations so all technical thing will have some limitations and this is one of the limitation of this kind of online interaction so thank you very much now i welcome all the questions uh on this topic that was indeed a very beautiful session uh so are we ready to take on the uh, questions sure sir first question is from uh, subramaniam pillai uh, mentioning that sir is there any book which you recommend to learn about automation and forensic um there is not one comp 
comprehensive book, I would say. But there are books on uh, uh, or book, uh, you can say editorial volume on uh, forensic pattern recognition, sometimes document image processing. These kind of books are there. But a comprehensive textbook which talks about automated forensic examination, there is no book as such. So that is again an opportunity for us. We can write a book which will be comprehensive on uh, forensic automated examination. I hope Subramanyam have got the answer. <laughs> and next, uh, he's mentioning suppose if someone altered any text with the same pen used by an initial author, is there any possible way to identify it? See, yes, possibility is always there, and uh, it depends on how you extract features. Right? Let's say you can say that, okay, two strokes by the same pen has been made at two different point of time, right? Yeah. So again, if you enlarge it and go for the texture analysis, you can uh, get some idea from there. You can get some idea. Okay. Thank so you. it will all depend on us because the system, we are making the system, we are designing the feature and everything is lying in the feature which we are extracting. Okay, sir. And the next up we have from uh, Dr. Vijay Pal uh, asking, is it possible to differentiate identical handwriting in terms of style and pattern, etc., of two different individuals? Yeah, of course, there are many systems around the globe. We have also designed a system which we have discussed. Uh, the examples of uh, those systems are uh, Cedar, Fox, Vanda, then uh, Fish. These are the name of the systems which are working at different part of the world. There are many, Okay. but and we are the, not using them. Okay, and the next we have from Priya Sharma uh, asking, Sir, can you suggest some open sources software for handwriting examination and examination of alteration using image processing? Alteration, I don't know whether uh, there is an open source, but see uh, this alteration work we have done uh, in the period uh, 2009 to 12. And after that, the work was taken forward by a team of uh, ISM, ISM IIT Dhanbad. So they have uh, done work on that, but uh, I don't know, neither in our case and nor in their case, it is existing in open source. I think it is not. So Madhulika ma'am has uh, uh, raised her hand. Uh, I'm unmuting her. Good afternoon, madam. Delighted to see you here. <laughs> very good afternoon, a very good presentation, but I have one question. If the person is holding two pens in one hand and writing it, can you yes. differentiate? Sorry, madam. If two person persons. Okay. is holding two pens simultaneously. Okay. And then he is writing. Okay. Right. Can you differentiate that also? By the same hand or different hand? Same hand. Same both hand. pen are in one hand and he is the expert in writing both it. the line will come one upon other like that no as if okay. natural writings are there okay so okay how can you will differentiate that in, in that case if the person has trained himself or trained his brain to write uh, the text from two uh, you can say pens simultaneously and mm. if both are having similar kind of quality so of course that can be done that can't be that can be done can be be done for okay. me there is nothing okay. I mean, uh, only we by saying it. can be done i'm not satisfied because you have to re uh, give me a reason by these these points we can do it can you give me some points uh, yes so mm -hmm. let's say if but some person is writing can be done what is in your mind i want to know that no how you will do yeah. it okay okay so you are talking as automated kind of method or manual? If it's automated and manual, is there will be a difference in both okay. of them? Yeah, of course. Like if we are saying manual, so yeah. manually what we are looking at, we are looking at what kind of variability is going to come in that. So let's say if we have got some suspected samples, which is a question mm -hmm. document, and then mm -hmm. we have also got some standard document. Okay. 
standard we need to uh, need to have for comparison purposes so if we are having those things so what we are going to see is the features or maybe the characteristic for manual examination so mm -hmm. what kind of characteristic we are getting there so whether mm -hmm. the characteristic which is by the two pens writing is different altogether or similar kind of things are coming if the mind has been trained in a way that it should come at same thing so mm -hmm. that will be easier but if the mind is not enough trained so there may be difference between the two writing like okay. if somebody is writing in that order so what i think the features hmm. as an expert it is okay but as a layman i think still you can do it because both pen have not equal pressure by the uh, holding together but not equal pressure will come on the writing one right. point which i can think over it no right right so that there is another valid point yes you are right ma'am oh, thank you so much ajay thank, thank you, you well you done you have done very nice well. to see you again here yes <laughs> thank, thank you beta thank you, thank you. so we had another raised hand from sweety Sweetie, do you want to say anything or ask anything, or it was by mistake? I guess sir, it was by mistake. No so, problem at all. I hope we have taken every question. So. Okay. Thank you so much, sir, for delivering such a knowledgeable session. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. Thank you. just see the comment from the participants; they all have uh, grab a great knowledge. So, thank you so much for uh, sparing your time with us, sir. Thank you. Are you also taking feedback of uh, uh, yes, sir. the yes, sir? Yes, sir. We are taking a feedback. Feedback form is already. Yeah, so please in, share uh, with me uh, later on. Sure, definitely, sir. Definitely, we will do, sir. Okay. Thank so you, thank you. May I leave now? Ah uh, no, I'll stop over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh, sir. It was indeed an informative session as well as uh, it enlightened us with the knowledge of uh, the Daubert motion and the criteria as well as what uh, part of uh, forensic examination can be automated. And in this honor, I would like to uh, I would request you to. Accept this certificate as a token of appreciation from our side. Uh, Thank you very much. This certificate is awarded to Dr. Rajesh Kumar for delivering an expert talk on automated forensic examinations issues and challenges. Thank you so much, sir, for sparing your time and uh, giving us to us. Giving. Thank you very much. Giving Thank us. You. Thank you so much, sir. It was a very nice session from your side. Uh, Thank obviously. you. Obviously, we had many issues, technical issues, but uh, the knowledge cannot be considered as a weak in any sense. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, may I leave now? Uh, definitely, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, all the participants, uh, there is a link. For, link for the downloading the certificate in the chat box. You can download your certificate from there. Thank you so much everyone for being with us today.